The best time to write is now. The best place to write is here. The best person to write is you. Thank you very much. I am Azriel Johnson, director slash founder of Writing Nights. It is December 8th, 2017, our last Take the Night Off for the year. I want to thank you all for joining us. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> we have three amazing features tonight. Daria Quinn, J.M. Romig, and Lorraine Cipriano. Give them rounds of applause. <laughs> um, this is our most, this is our, probably our closest to Christmas. So, and the one, only one before Christmas. So I'm going to shamelessly hawk our page a day poetry anthology. 365 poems over 365 days. You should buy a copy to the person you love so they can have a poem every day. And so doing, I'm going to read the poem from December 8th. Now this was released in 2015, but. Poetry stands the test of time. Poetry stands the test of time. This is called Outside the Lines by Jack Equality Smith. They gave us booklets made from heap manila paper. The slick covers and bright colors catch the eye, inviting us to open and peruse, yet those bright line drawings stifle the imagination by limiting our range. Suggested, requested, enforced colors, limited to powers of eight, become the only acceptable response. Originality, creativity, nonconformity are all forbidden. Skies are blue, grass is green, and apples are red. Flesh is peach, and hair is yellow. All right. Skies are blue, grass is green, and all apples are red. Flesh is peach, and hair is yellow, black or brown. Tree trunk brown, chimney red, daffodil yellow. Control is all important. Go outside the lines. No recess, no sunlight, no neon orange purple sunsets for you. Is society really so fragile that a green barn or a purple cat can bring it to its knees? <laughs> uh, for people who are here, you should have some flyers near you. You should have a flyer for next month, which is January 12th. Uh, we have three amazing features. Aurora, uh, I almost said Gerstung because... <laughs> I have a character named Aurora in my novel. Aurora Melman, uh, John Walters, and Atomic Houdini will be here. That's going to be an amazing show. You all should come out. Um, also, you'll have a flyer from a previous show. The reason you have that flyer is because on the back there are po there are writing prompts. Please feel free to write on about those writing prompts and then maybe share them later. That could be fun. Fun. Okay. <laughs> Um, also, if you don't feel like writing on those prompts, we do have some prompts hanging here from this other mic stand. Um, social media over here. Just search writing nights. You'll find you'll either find us or you'll find a, an eighth grade class in Texas. So, like, you know that we've been doing this since like, 2011 or whatever. I don't care. I'm not, I'm not going to sue you or anything, but you might want to check up on what plagiarism is going on with your kids. But, uh, that's all right. All right. Uh, throughout the night, we will be giving out some door prizes from Cantonology, uh, from The Hub, and um, I already gave out some door stuff from Modern Ritual. Modern Ritual. Okay. Without further ado, our first feature um, is a fill-in, so I don't have a legit bio for her, but I think you'll kind of get what she's about when she comes up here. Please welcome Daria Quinn. presentation is TV 14. Please silence your cell phones now and the show will begin. In. Now, hello, my name is Daria Quinn and I am a god. Not the god, mind you. That's a bit more complicated. 
Basically, <laughs> the God is not so much a being as he is a concept. The idea that all there was, is, and ever will be is connected by a single shared origin. And to our knowledge of science in the cosmos, it's true. We all come from hydrogen and carbon and share a common lineage with stars and snails. However, despite all of that, we are unique because we know ourselves. We have a greater understanding of ourselves in the cosmos than any other creature we have ever observed. We built homes, invented machines, we discovered fire, electricity, and magnetism and bent them to our will. We have powered our engines through sunlight, water, wind, and the fossilized remains of the dead centuries past. We have forged civilizations, founded nations, built churches and synagogues in tribute to powers beyond our comprehension, yet still managed to hold on to the curiosity of a child and seek out the answers to questions we have only just learned to ask. Our creativity makes us gods, whether that's expressed through arts, machinery, science, philosophy, literature, athletics, mathematics. We have always looked at what is and asked ourselves what could be. What can be? What can we do different? What can we do better? Can this change? And will that change be for the better? And if not, why not? And let's see if we can change that too. We refuse by virtue of our very existence to be shackled to our limitations as we reach towards greatness. We are the culmination of billions upon billions of centuries of nuclear reactions, mutation, adaptations, diversifications, and conceptions. And it is through us that the next great thing in this universe will come to pass, if not by our hands, by the hands of our children's children's children. If you are alive and you have a soul, a thought in your mind, and the will to carry it out, you too are God. So a couple months back, I, along with Azrael and Skylark, and Aurora, who you'll see next month, uh, we did a bit of a presentation at a Halloween festival. And at this Halloween festival, I share a couple, a couple poems based on a series of 10 that I wrote about the Bill of Rights. And this was met with a little, eh, not exactly happy reaction by one of the truck vendors. So I'm going to first share with you the poems that uh, offended him so greatly and my response to his offense. <sighs> Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution of the United States. These were considered by our founders to be the 10 most important things that each person is inherently entitled to by merit of being a United States citizen. I will spare you the entire 10. I will just go through the ones I shared that day. So what are these inalienable rights? For one, we have freedom of speech. This is the First Amendment. This makes it so the government cannot retaliate against us for speaking out against it. This is also one of the most fundamentally misunderstood rights, as many claim that freedom of speech requires that a platform be given to all, and that one may suffer no consequences whatsoever for what they say. It's not. It merely says that the government cannot punish you for criticizing it. This right also extends to the press. As the founders understood that for a country to be prosperous, it must also be properly informed. And in order to guarantee a free and independent press, journalists and publishers must also be protected from government retaliation. The First Amendment also covers religious establishments. But unlike the provisions outlined for the press and the average citizen, it's not just about protecting the, church by the church's right to speak, but an assurance that the church will hold no sway over the federal government. And in turn, we're promised that the government will not endorse or favor a particular religion. This is to ensure that the atrocities, like the Spanish Inquisition, could never happen in America, even though they totally did. But Americans don't like to attribute manifest destiny to Christianity so much, so let's move on. The Second Amendment, according to some, guarantees a gun in the hands of every American. You get a gun, and you get a gun, and you get a gun, and everybody gets a gun! Yay, guns! Except that's not what the Second Amendment guarantees at all. It actually says that a militia made up of private citizens assembled for the purpose of maintaining peace in their community shall not have their rights to bear arms infringed. In other words, this amendment is fairly useless in a modern context. 
It never says anything about private citizens having unlimited access to firearms. It doesn't even really say that owning a gun is a basic human right. It says that if you're a member of a private citizen militia in an area where your presence is necessary to the security of your neighborhood, you should be allowed to bear and keep firearms. If anything, this amendment would apply to groups such as the Black Panthers, who took to maintaining law and order on the streets of black neighborhoods because the local police couldn't be trusted to protect the interests of, black, of the black community. Huey P. Newton had more rights to a gun than Charlton Heston ever will, but we don't call Charlton Heston a terrorist, do we? The Tenth Amendment is considered the state's rights amendment. A favorite of conservatives and libertarians often used as an excuse to defer federal civil rights legislation and allow the states to uphold traditionally racist, sexist, and homophobic policies stalling the progress of social justice and equality in the name of preserving states' rights. And in case you're wondering what states' rights actually are, it's basically the declaration of anything that isn't being covered by the federal government that isn't also specifically prohibited as the power of the states is the power of the states. I know, it sounds confusing. <laughs> this creates a perfectly legal loophole to put a halt to social progress and civil rights because the states have no federal mandate forcing them to respect the rights of marginalized people. This is why the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title IX of the, of the Education Amendments of 1972, and the Supreme Court ruling that legalized marriage equality in 2015 are so very, very important because without a federal mandate to protect the rights of marginalized people, the 10th Amendment can be weaponized against those without federal civil rights protections. This offended a pierogi truck vendor so badly <laughs> that he uh, decided to shout at me from the distance that uh, I was ruining this family event. So, just imagine he's over there. Your flag is red, your flag is blue, your flag is white, and so are you. Placed atop your concessions truck, you have just made a political statement at this so-called family event. So when you shout at me as a coward in the distance that my politics have no place here, may I remind you that flag on your truck is a political statement. That American flag is not a benign symbol. It is the authoritarian reinforcement of a jingoistic value system that demonizes the other and uplifts the privilege of the white male, whom you just happen to be sitting in your truck, shouting at me as a coward in the distance, trying to silence a dissenting voice, because your flag is your politics. And you support the system I speak out against. If gun control and civil rights are words that children's ears should never hear, then gun violence, slavery, discrimination, and segregation are even greater crimes against our children. Silence will not end this injustice. And waiting for an allegedly appropriate hour to speak only results in delays and deference, tools the white man uses to hold everyone else down, told policing our anger, calling out demonstrations at public events inappropriate, and if now is not the time to discuss my civil rights white man, when is? When does this marginalized citizen's mere existence stop being political long enough to have a proper conversation about my rights? It doesn't. So I will stand here and speak my piece for children's ears to hear because it is only then that my voice carries weight. For when your children learn of the injustices you have allowed in the name of preserving white America, they will learn what we have always known, that your flag is a tool of the oppression we face every single day living under it, that the promises this nation makes to your children, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Every last word of that is a lie. And the flag that sits upon your truck is a reinforcement of that lie. And I will not protect your lies for the sake of your children. I will speak the truth to power for every child in this nation here because they deserve to be told the truth about you, about the flag that sits upon your truck, the political statement that you wave in my face to oppress and silence me when I take this mic. This is no longer a family event. It is an educational seminar about the real America. 
The America that is red and yellow and brown and black and covered in rainbows. The America your flag doesn't represent. Your flag drips with the red blood on the hands of white skin, burying the shameful blue underneath its white stars. And I will not stand silent in the face of your political statement any longer. First Friday, a friend of mine and I stopped into the vintage clothes shop, about three or four, three doors that way. Check it out, it's got some good stuff. However, um, question came up and I kind of had a strange answer to it. So I walk into a vintage clothes store when a friend asks, what era would you be given the choice? I wouldn't, is the honest reply. Because nothing in the store fits me anyway. Not much for vintage clothes, or that much vintage, much of anything. Some of the media of the past is okay, but nothing I'd want to relive. Living in a past era doesn't appeal to me, even if their fashion sense did. I look at the past as a failed experiment, a blueprint for what not to do to enhance the future. I'm not one to fabricate and romanticize a past that never once existed, and pine for nostalgia viewed through prisms of pop culture. You want to know what era I'd be? probably dead in all likelihood, either because I forced myself to live as a lie and, and off myself, or tried to live as a truth and got myself killed by a bigot. I don't want to go back to a time that never was or wear the clothes of a culture that suppressed all creative thought. I want to be something different, something better, something new, something the world hasn't seen yet because everything else has been played out. The aesthetics of the past don't appeal to me because I personally can't separate the fashion of the, from the culture of oppression. I don't want to live in a bygone era. I want to live in a time where I don't have to hide who I am just to survive. I can't even manage to do that in the present, let alone the past. What era, if I, what era would I be if given the choice? Well, if I know it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Transgender people, we're not a new thing. We've existed long before you, long before America, even long before the gender binary. We have been here long before Caitlyn Jenner, Jazz Jennings, Laverne Cox, and the Wachowski sisters. Perhaps you're familiar with Martha P. Johnson. Actually, no, probably not. Martha Johnson is often forgotten, a critical piece of LGBT history, sadly ignored even within our community. Marsha Johnson threw the first rocket that started the riots at Stonewall. She initiated gay pride before the parades. She fought the raids. Her act of defiance is the first shot fired in the battle for gay and transgender liberation. She started all of this, and you likely never heard of her. Not only because she was queer, but because she was black. And in America, we have a tendency to overlook that. Black History Month comes and there's never a mention. Pride Month comes and only the transgender pay her attention. How our Pride Month began, the rallies and parades, all started with a woman who was sick and tired of police raids. She lived in a time where simply wearing a dress was illegal. This was 50 years ago, barely a generation removed. Cops would raid the stone wall and arrest all the cross-dressers. Martha Johnson said, fuck that, and attacked her oppressors. She threw the first stone, yeah, I said threw the first stone, taken directly from the Bible because Marsha Johnson never sinned. Her dress was a bullshit crime, her rights were constantly infringed, all because she wanted to go dancing on a Saturday night in Greenwich Village. Imagine for a second that your entire existence was deemed a crime. That every time you just wanted to go out with friends, you'd do time. That the clothes you wear were considered obscene and the life free of police harassment was considered just a dream. Think for a moment before you consider the pronouns you use to define my gender. Think of the violence that trans women encounter, both physical and mental, compounded forever into a single act that you can control. Whether you understand it or not, it's a matter of respect. I introduced, you, I introduced myself to you as female, who happens to be transgender. The female is a noun, transgender, a modifier. 
My pronouns don't change simply because I'm transgender. I was introduced to you as a woman. I expect to be regarded as such. And no amount of age or ignorance allows you to rebuff the basic human respect that I am owed and deserved. I am a woman, now take me at my word. Anything less is absolutely absurd. This, this is a really old one. This was originally written in 2008 as a knee-jerk reaction to the nomination of Sarah Palin <laughs> as the vice presidential candidate for John McCain. Well, those were the days. Yeah. Uh, back, back in the days where, where candidates like that were considered the jokes that they are. So, um, as we go, Jesus has ordained me as a saint to rule over the United States. With an iron fist and an iron will, I will reform this nation better still. We'll all be Christian. We'll all be saved. One nation under God or else. I'll do what I want. I don't give a fuck. I'll bully the world until I get what I want. I'll ban all the books that I don't like. I'll fire anyone who won't tell my line. And I won't take shit from anyone, especially the press, when they do their job. I'll suppress your freedom and control your thoughts. Abuse my power all I want. I'll do what I want. I don't give a fuck. I'll bully the world to get what I want. Jesus has ordained me as a saint to rule over the United States. So don't you fuck with me or else you'll pay. I'll reform this nation either way. If you're not with me, you're against me between a girl and her gun. I'll do what I want. I don't give a fuck. I'll bully the world to get what I want. one was a reaction to 9-11. Peace is overrated. The population demands action, so that is what we give them. In the form of planes flown into buildings, tell them who's to blame. The president, the CIA, or a Middle Eastern boogeyman whose name will fill in later. It doesn't really matter. Their motives are the same. It's blood for oil and God above who demands your compliance. There's panic in the streets. Thousands die and millions mourn as a tragedy becomes yet another battle cry. Now here's a good excuse to offer up our children as a ritual sacrifice to the gods of revenge. <sighs> this next one was actually cut from the Halloween, uh, the Halloween presentation, or the fact that we were trying to keep the PG, and this kind of reaches into like TV 14. Hollywood rape culture, a branch of the patriarchy that makes our bodies into commodities to be assumed and consumed by those with the money to spend and the stroke to make things happen. Nudity on the big screen at age 19 in order to ensure that you're still getting work at 24. A quick, quick, quick bit of dick with a producer on his casting couch. Maybe if you're good, he'll put, you, he'll put in a good word. Assure you a career well into your 30s. Provided you can keep yourself looking good and thin and willing to fuck the producers again and again. No was never a barrier for you. Yes was only a key to the gate for us. And once you were finished taking what you wanted, you only let us through the gate if you liked the way we fucked. Never had a position, in, we never had a position to negotiate from. It was suck my cock or never work in this town again. The system was rigged by you and your dude bro conspirators, buying for prime pussy real estate, getting in on the ground floor. You staked your claim on women as if they were the new world and you were Christopher Columbus, 
plant your flag on this pussy that was never yours to claim. You exploit and manipulate and cajole and destroy. And we call this concept rape culture. You call it business as usual. The environment fostered by your self-declared entitlement to our bodies puts us on this casting couch within your fingers' reach, forced to place a price on our bodies and souls to appease your greasy, creeping fingers or go back <clears throat> or go back home and wait tables at a diner where all the preach where all the patrons all grab at your ass. Hollywood is just an exaggerated example of some of the sexist systems found more subtle outside of it. Advancement comes to those with open legs for easy lays. This is not a price for work that anyone should be forced to pay, yet this is the gate you place before us to earn a living wage. My body will never belong to you or any other man, for I am not property. You will not be allowed to take me by force, tax-free, to raise a flag or plant a tree. I reject your claim as the natives rejected Columbus. I reject your gospel as a heretic rejects Jesus Christ. Keep your dick pics and your decent proposals. I will forge my own way. Inspired the, by the women of Olympia, Washington, 1990. I'll go punk rock DIY, wire girl to fight. Self-publish, self-produce, self-distribute, self-promote. I will become the new wave of feminist creative media without you, without the casting couch, without your glass ceiling. Mm. There used to be a heart in here, a part of us that cared for beauty, now beauty's dead and we're all chasing open legs and easy lays. There used to be a soul in here, what words were said they held their meaning. Nowadays words fall like rain, nothing is said, no one's listening. We're all, busy we're all too busy chasing Miley or bitching about Kanye West. We never take the time to notice that art is dead and we all killed it. We used to create works of passion, songs and picture that, pictures that conveyed feelings. I can't believe we fully lost that. The collective human soul is nearly dead, but I don't believe that art is dead. I just don't understand this lifestyle. Hennessy and banging strippers, chasing fame, there's no tomorrow, burn through cash like MC Hammer. TMZ outside my door, wondering what drugs I'm on, or if I even bother to put on underwear today. Beer used to be a damn good reason an artist would ever turn to drugs. Nowadays, we're all just loaded at the strip club, making it rain, calling women tricks and hoes, degrading ourselves, acting like dogs, as T-Pain raps, and I'll on a tune, a top 40 porno soundtrack, but I do not believe that art is dead. But it probably is. <laughs>